Hi, my name is Veronique and I worked uh, at the University of Toronto in Gary Butter's lab and in the field uh, called Pathway and Network Analysis. So I'm a biologist and I work for, for people at OICR Cancer Stem Cell in Toronto that are also biologists. So the tools that I'm going to show are very accessible to everyone. <laughs> And so this lecture is like a transition from the lecture that you had uh, this morning uh, with Daniel. So you got like a gene list from your variants and uh, to the lecture that is going to be presented this afternoon where we are going to use also a pathway network analysis. So the learning objective of the module, so to, to understand the basic concepts of pathway network analysis, to be able to recognize different gene identifiers and gene attributes, and to understand how simple, simple enrichment analysis tools work. And we are going to visualize uh, our results uh, using cytoscape. So, so when do you want to interpret a, a gene list? Yeah. Usually it's when you've done like a, a large uh, genomics analysis and like Daniel showed you this morning, you got your gene list, your variants could be also from gene expression data and you have like quite a lot of genes. And you want to uh, know what is interesting about these genes. And one question that we are going to answer in pathway network analysis is are these genes enriched in known pathways? So first, we should define pathways. What are pathways? And when we do uh, like functional analysis, pathway network analysis, mainly there are signaling, signaling pathways and metabolic pathways. But very often, we are also interested by drug uh, association or disease association. And Sometimes I will talk about gene set. So what is a gene set? We'll say that it con contains all genes in a defined pathway or in a part of a pathway. So I will use pathway or gene set. So what are the advantages of pathway network analysis? That first, it saves time to compare to a traditional approach. So the traditional approach would be to look at your genes one by one and to do search, like PubMed search, to know what these genes are and try to make associations between these genes. But it's really time consuming. And the other thing, if you do it like manually, you don't have time to look at all the genes, so you are going to focus sometimes on your favorite gene. Oh, your favorite gene is in, in the list. So it's biased. But the bioinformatic approach will be save time and less biased because you look at everything in your list. And also, I think it's an intuitive way of analyzing your results. Um, at least for me, because I'm a biologist, so I don't know. But usually we have like a good knowledge <laughs> of the cells, and you can imagine the cells and the nucleus and the membrane, and you have a receptor, and you have the signal that comes in your receptor and traps the signals, and you have all this signal and pathway in, in, in your mind. So pathway network analysis will draw a map uh, uh, of these pathways that you are going to analyze. So it's more, much more intuitive. So you will have your gene list, your pathways that come from a pathway database, we will find the overlap between your gene list and your pathways, and we will see it as a network. Another advantage of this kind of analysis is that it can, is, it can enable you to find overlap at the pathway level. So I don't know if you got uh, this problem. I, I got this problem quite often. You do two types of genomics analysis, like RNA-seq, uh, chip seek, whatever, you have your hits, you compare your hits, and you don't find any overlap, any direct overlap. There is no genes that are in common between your hits of the, your first analysis and your hits of your second analysis. 
But you cannot say there is no overlap until you have done the pathway network analysis because you may have overlap at the pathway level. And this is one of these examples. You, you, you do uh, CNV, you find muta mutations in patients. So patient 1 has mutation 1, patient 2 has mutation 2, patient 3 uh, uh, have mutation 3. So they are all different, but they target the same pathway and all these patients are di diabetic. So this is a pathway level. And usually when you find like uh, an overlap at the pathway level, you should, very, you should be very happy because that's what you are looking for. And now I'm going to show you an example uh, of, of the use of pathway network analysis from this paper. So I don't know if you saw it like yesterday or the day before. Genomic and transcriptomic architecture of the breast cancer. So they use like a large cohort of patients, breast cancer patients, and they had also normal samples. They did copy number variants and they, they did at the same time uh, Illumina gene expression. So copy number variants were on uh, Aphis nipships and gene expression on Illumina. And they did this EQTL, expression quantitative trait lucky, to find association between the CNB and the genes that were dysregulated, so at the expression level. And they found what they call transacting aberration hotspot. They define the hotspot by more than 30 mRNAs with dysregulated expression associated with a one CNV. Okay, so in a subgroup of patients, they found a CNV and they, they defined a gene list, let's say about 100 genes, that were also dysregulated in this patient that had the CNV. So, and now they want to interpret the gene list and they use pathway network analysis. So, one figure. So, this is the output. And this is like, let's say, the, the CNV and the association with the expression level, the EQTL result. So, here, this is the, like the chromosome, the whole chromosome, uh, whole genome, sorry. And you have like two lucky TRA and TRG that have a deletion, okay? Deletion here, deletion here. And here on the horizontal axis, you have like a few genes, maybe 100 genes, that have dysregulated expression associated with these two deletions. They took the gene list, they did pathway network analysis, and this is the output. So this is a map, each node, each circle, of the map is a pathway. The lines are edges, they are genes that overlap between pathways. And when you look at the titles of these pathways, they are all related to like T cell function. And the CNV, the deletion were in the T cell receptor, so from the immune response. So the CNV, uh, were corresponding to T cells to mature T cells because when the T cells uh, become more differentiated, they rearrange their T cell T uh, cell receptor. And here, it's also related to T cells. So what does it mean in this subgroup of patients? They had in the <coughs> breast tumors, they had T cells, infiltrated T cells, and. And the prognosis, prognosis of this patient is good. So they are a better survival than the other groups. And they think because the T cells uh, gives an immunological response. So they, the T cells fight the cancer. Another figure, so this is the association matrix here. They have a deletion at chromosome, chromosome 5. And they have 100 genes associated with this deletion. But what does it mean? So they took these 100 genes, two pathway network analysis. Here is the map. So once again, one circle is a pathway. One line is an edge. And you have the title of the pathway. And you see, it seems all 
are related to cell cycle. So in this subgroup of patients that have the chromosome 5, they have mRNAs dysregulated and this is in correlation with cell cycle. And when you look at the survival index and the prognosis and uh, all this um, information, you will find that this sub subgroup are indeed, have indeed a higher uh, mitotic index. <coughs> so their cells is, are known to cycling more. And this is uh, the same gene list that is visualized using the Reactome FI plugin that you are going to see this afternoon. And now it's a, each node is a gene. So you have like a, a gene gene network, and you have functions association, associated with this network. So for example, the genes here in purple are all uh, corresponding to telomerase, the gene in yellow to cell cycle. So two different pathways where one is a pathway pathway network and one is a gene gene network. So what do we need to do pathway enrichment analysis? First, we need our gene list. Second, we need gene attributes that are coming from a pathway database. And then we are going to use tool to find the overlap between your gene list and these gene attributes. So some recommendation between, before you start a pathway network analysis. Try to clean your data as much as possible because if you input a true positive, then you are going to be confident about the results of your analysis. So you, can, you may have more true positive. A garbage in, garbage out. If you're not confident about your results, if, you're, if you don't have your true hits in your gene list, then you will ha have less confidence in the output of the results. Yeah? Can you put a score or a confidence score for every gene you have? Can, can you use or can you? So, yeah, so it depends on, your, on the tools you are going to use. Some very simple tools, you just put the gene like the gene names. Some other tools, and they are very interesting tools, you can rank your genes using the, the confidence. So this is something you, you can look at when you choose a tool. If you can have a value associated with your gene, like a confidence score, and you can rank this list, and your list is, is uh, big enough, then you can choose these tools to do it. The confidence score represent what? It depends on your list. It depends on it, it depends on, on, on your experiment, but it could be uh, if you do uh, gene expression data, it could be the p-value, uh, it could be a score, how uh, the number of hits per gene, the number of mutations per gene. So it's really case by case. So yeah, your gene list size is important too. So for simple enrichment tools, like David, if you know, I would say 50 to 500 genes are optimal. But you, if you have few genes, 10 or 50, you still can do it, but just choose other kinds of tools, like gene function prediction tools. And if you have a large gene list, more than 500 genes, then try to rank uh, your list and try to use tools that um, that choose this ranking. And make sure that your gene IDs are compatible with the software. So yeah, so where do gene lists come from? So they can, like the pathway network analysis concept can be very general. So it's a case by case, could be uh, gene expression data, it could be uh, protein interaction data, genetic screen, association studies. And because uh, gene lists come from different sources, they are very different. So it's important that you know what you want to answer. And to understand that your experimental design has been done correctly to answer the question you want. And so you choose the right tool to answer your question. And yeah, you can summarize uh, the biological process, find differences 
find a controller for a process like a transcri transcription factor or microRNA, find new pathways, or so really uh, think about your experimental design and think about the question you want to answer. So we have a gene list and we need gene identifiers so that the pathway database uh, recognize your genes. And so maybe it's a, like a basic concept, gene identifiers, but if you work with a large amount of data, then you have to be very careful. And so identifiers are unique, stable names for, for a gene and like entries in ID or RefSeq. But we have many, many databases that store uh, information. So we have many, many gene IDs. So you need also to recognize that this gene ID, these identifiers, they don't recognize, they don't store the same information. Like if it's a protein database, then the gene ID is for protein. And if it's a, a gene ID is for a gene sequ uh, sequence, then it stores the gene sequence record. So it's important to recognize the right uh, gene ID identifier. And this is the common identifiers. So maybe you know some of them. I would recommend to use the most common ones for these tools, for the pathway network analysis tools, like Ensemble, Entresgene, RefSeq, and my two, the, the one I use more often are the entries gene ID and the official gene symbol. <coughs> and one tool that I like is gene card. So if you want to look for, you have a gene name and you want to access very rapidly some of the common identifiers, then you can uh, use gene card and you also have all the names and uh, much more information about the, this gene. So, my favorite entrance gene uh, identifier is entrance gene ID. It's a numerical value, so it's very easy to manipulate. It's also stable, so even if the gene has not been studied and don't have a gene symbol, he has uh, an entrance gene ID. So you don't have to update uh, your list all the time if you use entrance gene ID. Entrée. <laughs> and yeah, so entrée is a... <laughs> entrée is, is a database, is a, a, a retrieval system, and it has many, many connections with, between all these different databases. So even with entrée's gene ID, if you scroll down and you have links to the other uh, databases. One other, another one is RefSeq. Uh, so if you if you scroll down the, this page, then you are going to find the, the RefSeq identifiers like NM for mRNA and NP, P for protein. So because they sometimes, like, like for example, we got our data from uh, Illumina, and we have this Illumina probe ID, and we need to convert from one type of identifier to the other one, because we want to have the identifier that our tool is going to use. So we have um, tools, web tools, that we can use to convert from one type to the other. And we are going to see this uh, later. So when we have Many, many genes, we have to be, and we manipulate all this data, we have to be careful, so yet yeah, there are some ID challenges. So gene names, so that's why we prefer to, to use entrance gene ID and not gene names, because sometimes there is some ambiguity. There are many gene names for one gene. So be careful and try to use the official gene symbol if you use Excel, you're again going to have also trouble if you use the gene names because many genes like OCT4, September 4, or, or SEP4, are going to be changed as a date. And if you have thousands of rows, you may not notice it. So be careful if you use 
Excel and it's very very difficult to obtain 100% coverage so you are going to have missing values so if you really need 100% coverage try to use different sources and try to correct um, to add manually the, the missing uh, the missing annotations it could be yeah it could be yeah it could be due to this problem but um, sometimes uh, you have interest gene ID that don't, that don't have like a, a gene symbol and uh, things like that so it's not like hundred percent the databases are not overlapping at hundred percent so that's why you have mixing values sometimes I mean all, all the times so you have like a few missing values but sometimes and depending on the tool that you that you use and the, the like the version that you use then you may have this missing value so if you use Excel so this is the example of all, all these, these genes that were co converted to date so if you use Excel open first Excel then open your file you will have this text import wizard select the, your column with your gene symbol and, and set the column as text and this is another example from the uh, with, you have to be careful with the gene names it's a paper that has to be retracted they were working on HES1 but this name has this, this genes ha, uh, there is another gene in the database that has the same name it's quite old but still two names his one so the researcher thought he was working on Harry and answer of split one but he was working on the other one human homologous one so all this his paper was false like a yeah okay it's quite old so I think now the databases are a little bit better and it's more standardized but yeah he had a nice paper but <laughs> Not the wrong, the, but the wrong gene. So, and this is like a, a nice and easy tool that we are going to use in the lab, the synergizer, to convert from one uh, gene or uh, one identifier to the other one. And you also can use Biomart, and we will also use Biomart. So, our recommendations: map everything to entries gene ID. If 100% coverage is needed, then try to manually add the missing annotations. Be careful of Excel autoconversions. And what have we learned? Genes and their products and attributes have many identifiers. Genomics often requires conversions of IDs from one, one type to the other. But there are tools that are exist that exist and uh, yeah use common ID like interest in ID, RefSeq okay so now gene attributes so gene attributes come from the pathway databases this is and it will store all the functional annotations And so when we speak about pathway network analysis, we are more interested by function annotation. But we may be interested by other features like chromosome position, disease association, DNA properties, protein properties, and all these features, you can find them in, the, in a genome brother. And this one, the function annotation in the pathway databases. There are a few pathway databases Probably, you know, gene ontology. There's also CAG, Reactome, Biocarta. I'm going to talk about gene ontology, and this afternoon you are going to talk about like Reactome, Biocarta, and CAG. So, what is gene ontology? So, it's the largest database. It's updated very re uh, regularly, it covers many organisms and it's freely available. It covers 
three major aspects of gene function. Cellular component, component molecular function, biological process. Okay. So, plasma membrane would be a cellular component. This enzymatic reaction would be a molecular function. And cell division would be the biological process. So when you do pathway network analysis, normally you care about molecular function and biological process. And so, so Go is like a dictionary. It contains terms. And each term in the databases is related to each other. And it's like hi a hierarchy. And at the top of the hierarchy, you have the more general terms. And at the bottom of the hierarchy, you have the more specific terms. And you have two kind of rela relationships, either or part of. Like this red is part of, and this one is, is A. So here at the bottom, you have the term B-cell apoptosis. So B-cell apoptosis is part of B-cell homeostasis, but is a type of apoptosis, which is a type of programmed cell death, with a, which is a type of cell death. And so we called uh, parents and, and children and child. So this child can have multiple parents, and this parent can have multiple children. And now Go is going to associate one gene with Go terms. So you can have multiple associations. And this is an example of how Go associates uh, information to this gene, PROC1. So it's uh, manually curated. This is a paper about these genes. PROC1 describes the function of PROC1. So receptor-like kinase would be the molecular function. So Go term associate association. Uh, Integral membrane protein would be the molecular component, and wound response would be the biological process. So this is a manual creation, and you can have also electronic uh, creation that are not from papers, but are from prediction, bioinformatics prediction. So you want to know the association, how the associa associations were created. So these genes were associated with this Go term by IC, inferred by curator. This is what we called evidence types. And this gene, P PSMD4, was associated with this Go term by TAS, traceable author statement. This is the one I have presented here. You have this IEA, inferred by electronic annotation, it comes from predictions. So you, depending on your on your case, sometimes the tools offer the choices, and you can remove this IEA if you don't feel confident about this annotation. And when you have a Go term and you want to have more information about this Go term, then you, there is like a tool. There's different tools, but one of this tool is Quigo. It's a very simple web tool, and you can enter the the, the the, your Go term number, and you have like a lot of information, like the term information, ancestor chart, ancestor table, child terms, and we are going to use it during the lab. And the other database is CAG, I think you know it, Biocarta, Reactor, Ingenuity, which is commercial, so this is the, the only one that is not uh, freely available. And Pathway Commons that uh, regroup all this database are going to be presented this afternoon. So, and these as mentioned already, all these other attributes, you can find them using uh, Genome Brother. So, Ensemble Biomart is also a web tool that is really easy to use. 
to retrieve all these gene attributes. So you have your large gene list, you can copy and paste your large gene list and retrieve these uh, attributes. And we are going to use it uh, during the lab. So what have we learned? Gene attributes define functions, characteristics of a gene. Many genes attributes are stored in databases, like Go, Keg, Reacto. And many gene attributes are available from Ansible and Entrace gene. And this is just for your information, different URLs and source of attributes. Okay, now you we have our gene list with the right and identifiers. We have our uh, functional annotation. And we, what we want to, to find is the overlap between the two. And we are going for this, uh, we are going to use enrichment tools. So there are many tools that exist, and we can define these tools into three categories. The first one is functional pathway analysis. The second is class scoring. And the third one is pathway topology. Uh, this first one represents the most simple one, like David, if you know. It's ideal if you have like a gene list from like I would say 50 to 500 genes. You just have the gene names. You don't have any values associated with your genes. The second one, a class scoring. So if you have like a larger gene list and you are able to have scores associated with these genes and you can rank your genes, then you, you can use these tools. And one example is GSEA. And the third one is pathway topology. So pathway topology, it, it uses uh, the functional annotation. But in addition to that, it uses the relationships between your genes to build the network and to score the significance of your results. So let's say in your gene list, you have 10 genes that are from a, a given pathway, pathway A. But from this, in these 10 genes, you have five genes are inhibitors of the other five. So it means you have five genes that activate, five genes that inhibit these, these genes that activate. It makes less sense that if you ha just had 10 genes that go in the same direction to activate your pathway. So pathway topology, topology uses use this information to to, to build the network, and you are going to see an example this afternoon with the React MFI plugin. So you are going to see that in much more details this afternoon. So what is gene set enrichment analysis? It breaks down the cellular function into gene sets. So different gene sets. And you are going to find the overlap of your gene list and these gene sets. And you want to see if this overlap is significant or not. So does it occur just by random chance or not? So the tools that, in general, what they are going to do is calculate the overlap. So here, this is my pathway A. And here, this is my 100 genes that are significant. And let's say I have 30 genes that overlap between the significant genes and the pathway. Is this overlap larger than expected by chance? How can I do that? Then I will select randomly 30 genes out of the genome. Uh, 100, let's say, 100 genes, because I have 100 genes. If I select randomly 100 genes, what are the chances that I get 30% of overlap? And I'm going to do it many, many times to be able to build the, the, the significant score. For the simple tools, so the first category that I showed you, they usually use the Fisher's exact test. So I have here five genes, four black, one red. And the background population here is my genome. In my genome, I have uh, 4,500 red and 500 black. What is the probability or what is the chance to get four black 
and one red in my gene list. So the first, the null hypothesis would be that my list is a random sample from population. But if I reject the hypothesis, it will be, yeah, well, it's not by chance. I have more black uh, genes than expected in my list. Okay. So first, the Fisher's exact test is going to build the null distribution randomly. So what is the probability, this is my genome, my gene universe, to have five red balls. So I take five uh, genes or balls randomly. What is the probability to take five red? 57% because we have more red than black. What is the probability to, get, to take four red and one black, 35%, and so on. And what is the probability to take four black genes and one red is very low, because you don't have that many black genes in the genome. And let's say that the black genes are one particular pathway, and this is apoptosis. Okay? So then your cutoff would be this value, and the p-value of the Fisher's exact test is going to be the sum of this of the p-value that are equal or less than my cutoff. Okay, so the probability is 0 0.001, which is less than 0 0.05. So you can be confident that that is not expected by chance. So to have in my list four genes that are belonging to the hypoptosis pathways is not by chance. So they are all work, all these tools are worked using the, this kind of concept. We usually test for the, um, of a representation of a pathway in our gene list, but you can also test for the under enrichment of your pathway, of a particular pathway, but it's very rare. <coughs> for this kind of test, you, you need to choose your background pop population Normally, if you use like a genome-wide experiment, you don't need to set the background. But if you work with an array that is not representative of the whole genome, then you need to set your background population. So what we did, we have calculated this p-value for this particular gene set. We need to do it for all the pathway that we are testing, that we have in our databases. So, we test many, many pathways, and then normally the output of an enrichment and pathway analysis is like a tabular format with all the gene sets we have tested and the p-value. And we ranked from the most significant to the less significant. And because we are testing so many, many pathways, we need to correct for multiple hypothesis testing. So that's why when you see the output of a, an enrichment analysis, you have the p-value and after the, the p-value column, you usually have the, the FDR. So the FDR is the false discovery rate. It corrects for multiple hypothesis testing. It's the expected proportion of the observed enrichment due to random chance. So if you have a FDR of 15%, it means you have 15% chance to have like a false positive. What is the best cutoff for the p-value to say that's significant or not significant? Um, yeah, it depends. Uh, usually, people say 0 0.05. It's arbitrary. Uh, it's always better to rank from the most significant to less significant because 0 0.05 is is from an equation, so it's it's a, a theory. But usually, it's 0 0.05. And so, um, usually the FDR is calculated by, uh, the most common is the benjamini Holberg uh, correction, and it's, always, it's often called the Q-value. So, what have we learned? The typical output of an enrichment analysis is a t like a table, and the minimum information that you will have are the pathway names, the number of, of overlapping genes between your gene list and your pathways, the number of genes in the pathway, like apoptosis has 500 genes, the p-value associated, and the corrected or adjusted p-value. 
and this is usually the output. It's not very clear, it's difficult to interpret, and also there are many, many pathways that, that are related to each other but because there are genes in common. So that's why we use network visual visualization to, to output the results as a network. And we use the Cytoscape software to do that. So Cytoscape is an open source software used to, visual, to visualize complex networks. It's uh, open source and there are a lot of apps that we call plugins for different tools. So when you, first you have to download Cytoscape and then you have to download the plugins you want or you can create your own plugin. The advantage of network the, the major advantage is that it enables you to represent relationships. So you are going to be able to represent the relationships between the pathways, if you do a pathway network, or the relationships between the genes, if you do a gene-gene network. So, two basics. First, you need to understand the concepts of nodes and edge, edges. So again, two network possible, gene gene network. Each node or each circle node is a gene. So this gene is related to the other one by an edge. If you have a pathway network, each circle or node is a pathway <coughs> related to each other, to the other one by an edge. Here, the association between gene gene could be, okay, we know that they physically interact. Or you can have an arrow to say this gene is an activator of this, this one. On the pathway network, it could be the number of genes that are overlapping between the two pathways. And the second um, things you need to know is the automatic network layout. If you don't have any layout, we have something like this, like a hairball. You don't see anything. So you, put the, uh, you, you take the output of your enrichment result, and you put a network with that layout. It, it looks like this. So you cannot make any conclusions. So you need uh, to, do, to, to, to make a layout. And a Cytoscape has a different automatic layout. So the, I think the, the most common is the force directed layout. So nodes repel each other and edges pull. So if the nodes uh, are very connected to each other, then the edges are like springs and the nodes are going to be close to each other, like a cluster. But because nodes are repelling each other, they will not overlap. So you can see each, uh, each one of these nodes. And OK, so I hope you installed all Cytoscape. And this is just a basic introduction in case you haven't done the tutorial. So when you open Cytoscape, you have three parts. The, the first one is the control panel, the second is the data panel, and the third one is the results panel. Each time you create a network, you can save your session and open it later. To navigate through the network, you, know, like, like you have like a large network, you don't know how to navigate through the network, you go in control panel, to network, and you click on that, you have like a blue square. You can click on this square and move, the, and move it around to navigate for the, ne for the network. Then the layout, so you go to the menu, layout, Cytoscape layout, and you can choose the one you want. 
you can play and add a lot of visual features. You go to Control Panel, Viz Mapper, and you have all these cho choices. And you can modify the shape of a node, uh, modify the node size, um, and many other things. And you can do this beautiful network. Nodes are in different colors. Edges are also in different colors. It could be also the thickness of the edges. To, and it, if you want to prepare a figure for publication, and you can use uh, this visual feature, but it also helps you to, to define clusters and make the things more interpretable. So what have we learned? Networks are useful for seeing relationships in large data sets. It's important to understand what nodes and edges mean. <coughs> Automatic layout is required to visualize the networks. Visual attributes enable multiple types of data to be shown at once. I'm just going to show you two, exam two examples of Cytoscape plugins. The first one is Bingo. And it does like an enrichment um, analysis, like David. So using the Fisher's exact test, exactly as I uh, showed you. So all in Cytoscape. And it used the gene ontology database. It uses Go. So the output is a tree. Uh, that is related to the Go hierarchy. So with the general terms at the, the, at the top of the tree and the more specific terms um, at, the, at the bottom of the tree. And the color indicates if it's significant or not. It's like a significant enrichment or not. And another interesting um, plugin could be like Clustering. Sometimes you have a large, large network and you need to cluster your network. And this one is MCOD. And MCOD uh, enables you to cluster your network. And you see all these, these genes that have been clustered in your network. And at the end of my slides, I have a few uh, Cytoscape tips and tricks. I think that you can, I put them. In the, in the lecture for you, so you can read after the workshop. So I won't read it now, but you can read it. So network, this is one is a root graph, network reviews, sessions, login, memory, such so escape directory. This is an active community. So you can go to this website and you are going to find uh, many tutorials and a list of all the plugins that are available. And it's, it's a community that is growing. And that's it. And now we are going to go to the lab. <coughs>